Welcome to week five. Um, this week I'm going to cover in the lecture, I'm going to cover reorder level, uh, which is a fairly important concept. The concept is fairly simple, but sometimes people get a little confused with some of the things that go inside it. So I'm going to go over it a little bit. I'm going to go over safety stock, discuss what safety stock is for. I'm going to also include customer service level in relation to safety stock. It's a fairly important concept. I'm gonna be following up with an announcement with some extra information in the next day or two. So um, hopefully that'll help out. And then I'm going to uh, quickly apply safety stock and customer service level to a supply chain network example. This is something that's gonna be similar to what you're going to be seeing in about week seven. So um, hopefully it'll be useful. And uh, okay, without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and start. So the reorder level or reorder point, you'll hear both, both uh, concepts. Basically, this is defined at the point where, um, in which inventory position falls below a certain base stock level. Now, base stock level is a target inventory level. And the book kind of does, goes into some detail about this, but in general, your base stock level, um, also called an inventory position, is your net inventory plus your outstanding replenishment orders. So it's, it's important to, to understand that the reorder point includes any previous outstanding replenishment orders. Um, this, within the model that we use, it's not that big a deal because we assume that the replenishment occurs immediately. But in the, obviously a replenishment won't occur immediately. So obviously there's some lag. So if you use this reorder point, um, you will have to note that um, the model does, um, does assume that your re replenishment occurs immediately. So obviously when you apply real world to this, you're gonna have to um, just make a note that usually when, when we talk about a base stock level, that we use with the reorder point, it's the net inventory plus your outside replenishment orders. So um, reorder level um, includes level safety service similar to that used in customer service levels. Now, I'm gonna show you the diagram in a second, and this is going to have a safety stock level in which um, will be, we will use that in conjunction with, with our reorder point, okay? So um, just realize that when we do reorder level or, or reorder point, we also have to include safety stock. That is added to the reorder point when we do a calculation. So when we look at the, the, uh, our uh, graph here, it has a reorder point, and then we also have a safety stock point. So in this example, we start at 1,500 units, and one of the things about the model that we use is that we assume a constant decrease in product through consumption. So we have, basically, we have a fairly constant demand. Now, this doesn't mean that we have a fairly reliable demand that we have forecasted. It basically means that we have a fairly constant demand. So when we calculate the average inventory. Um, I covered this briefly in the last week's lecture. You basically take the max inventory and divide it by two. And the reason why is that if you take any number line from say zero to 10 or zero to 20 and you take the average of that line, that will be pretty much the, the average of the entire, um, well, if you take the maximum number and you divide it by two, that is the average of all the numbers put together. So uh, that's why we use the maximum divided by two. Once again, this is assuming we have a, a constant demand rate or a constant, constant uh, diminishing rate, okay? So as we go down, we have a reorder stock set at 1,200. So once the stock hits 1,200, the order is set. And right here we have 100 days. So this model includes lead time, okay, for the, for the product to get there to our stocks. So if, as you see here, we add the amount of product 
to maintain our demand for the lead time in our calculation. And then as it continues down through our lead time, we get to the safety stock level. And the safety stock level, safety stock is used to absorb demand variation. I'm gonna cover that briefly in a minute. Um, so, um, and this is, there's, a, there's probably a dozen ways to calculate safety stock. I'm gonna cover a couple of the more normal ones. Um, I'm gonna cover the one that the book uses. But just realize that there's no one set way to calculate safety stock. Okay, that's important. So once we hit the safety stock, if our calculations are all correct, we will suddenly receive our, um, our uh, product that we had ordered. So the assumption in this model, I think I mentioned earlier that the product that your, your uh, product arrives immediately. I was a little bit mistaken, sorry about that. What, this, what the model assumes is that you receive your entire reorder all at once. So um, there, be, there may be some instances where you may order and receive it in different, like two or three shipments or four or five shipments. We assume that everything is received all at once. And this is important because later on in the class, like week seven or so, you're gonna be calculating the costs of inventory. And you will, and that's one of the assumptions that is used in our inventory cost calculations, that all of the inventory is received all at once. Obviously, if it doesn't, arrive all at once, you have to change your calculations accordingly. So now, it goes down, and once again, you know, the reorder stock, reordering. So, so this is how reorder works in theory, okay? We have um, a, an EOQ, um, economic order quantity, uh, a uh, maximum amount of stock that we want to maintain. And then as we um, deplete, we're going to get to a certain point where we have a reorder, reorder uh, point, which once we hit that point, we order, and this, and this reorder point is, takes into consideration our uh, procurement lead time, so that this is lead time here. Then once we get to a point where we hit our safety stock level, and we've reached the end of the lead time waiting for our, our order to, to arrive, we suddenly have a spike in our inventory, and then we continue our merry way. So over time, you will have a zigzag. As you reorder, the um, inventory hits a reorder point. We order, once we hit the seed stock level, it goes up. In theory, you, shouldn't, you would never go below the safety stock, but in reality, it's not too uncommon. Because don't forget your demand variation uh, right upon where you set your customer service level, you may actually end up with more consumption than you have safety stock assigned for based on how much risk you are willing to take. Or, or sometimes it may be above your safety stock level if you have a very aggressive safety stock. So um, just realize that in the real world, it'll rarely hit the safety stock level, it'll hit nearby. So, um, which, is, which is kind of obvious here. All right. So, the reorder point formula is fairly simple. We take the average daily demand and multiply it by our average lead time. And once again, the average daily demand is, is um, um, we basically go and take, um, well, yeah, I'm trying to think here. Now, there's another one where you take your average inventory. Um, but um, I think I might cover that in a minute. But so basically, so the reorder point, basically we, we need to calculate um, how much we have to order to maintain a certain level of demand above our safety stock. So we calculate the average daily demand, which is basically uh, your demand forecast over a certain amount of period of time, take the average of that then and multiply that by the average lead time to replenish the inventory, okay, which is basically multiplied by your lead time. That's the length of time they're gonna wait for the inventory to arrive. Then we add our safety stock. Now, one thing that you're gonna notice is this, this formula initially ignores demand variation variability outside the safety stock. Um, you will see some reorder point calculations. Once again, there's, there's several reorder point calculations out there. 
There are some that do take into consideration demand variability. This is the one that's in the book. It's, it's fairly simple. But when we use this calculation, we assume that the demand variability will be fully absorbed by the safety stock. So all we care about, so in this example, the average daily demand multiplied by the lead time is gonna be our general amount of inventory that we will need to order. And we're going to let the safety stock absorb the variation in our demand variability. So, um, and the formula also ignores lead time variability. Um, and this is one thing, um, one of the assumptions in the reorder point formula based upon this formula is that we have a constant lead time. So um, obviously that there are some reorder point calculations that do take into consideration lead time variability. But if your lead time variability is fairly low, um, then um, that's fine. If it is high, then what some people do is they just, they add the variability into the lead time calculation up, up above um, based upon the, the uh, customer service level. So for instance, if you have a customer service level of 95%, whatever the Z-score is that, you can multiply your lead time by that. Um, and it just depends, well, you, you would multiply your lead time, not your lead time, sorry, let me back up. You multiply the standard deviation of your lead time by that number and add the lead time. So you can do that. Um, to clarify that, just in case you didn't understand it, if you want to calculate the lead time variation as, as a part of this calculation, basically you would do, you would take your Z-score, which is used for your customer service level. Um, and I've, I may not have covered that in class already, but I'm, I'm going to be sending um, an, an announcement that goes over this in, in, in great detail. And you basically take your, say your Z-score, which is like 1.9 or whatever, whatever the number is based upon the, the percentage chance that you're going to meet your customer demand, uh, which relates directly to your uh, standard deviation. And then you're going to mul multiply that by this by the actual standard de deviation, uh, one sigma with a standard deviation, um, to give you an addition to your lead time. You add your lead time to increase the amount of inventory that you add to that D times L to last you until you hit your safety stock level. So obviously. And using that will actually increase your reorder point. It actually raises it up because you're adding more inventory to your time for stuff to get from the reorder point to the safety stock level. So um, I've seen different people do it different ways. It just depends on how risk averse or how, you know, how much management wants to have an accurate, you know, or accurate, well, it's not completely accurate, but how much they want to go forward with reorder point. But you can also use this as a general calculation for reorder point. Okay. So this is a general calculation. This is a general, um, this is another calculation for reorder point. And this one's a little bit more detailed. It's pretty much the same as the other one. All it does is it actually breaks out the calculation for safety stock. So you have the average daily demand. Um, so um, times your lead time, which is what we had before. And then, then we add it to uh, basically the, the Z, uh, that's a sigma, then the square root of large L. That's how you calculate your safety stock in this example. Um, this is a way of showing it um, if you want to show the safety stock calculation. Once again, I have seen where people do add um, the standard deviation to the daily demand in the front end. Um, but if you but as you see here, the safety stock actually takes that takes that into consideration by adding safety stock above a certain level required to um, have inventory. So you so I've I've seen it both ways. You can either use your safety stock level and just don't worry about the standard deviation of your demand and your reorder point calculation, your D times L, or 
you could add the standard deviation times your z score to standard deviation and then just add it to the safety stock. You would do that if the safety stock calculation that you use doesn't include demand variability in your calculations. So um, for the rule of thumb, demand variability needs to be shown somewhere in your reorder point. This is kind of above what they do in the book, but um, for the book, all you really need, really need to worry about is this one here, really. And then just remember that your demand variability is absorbed by your safety stock, which actually here will go up or down right upon the um, z-score as it relates to your um, demand variability. Then I'm not sure if I covered customer service level in class yet, but I will, um, I'm gonna have a slide for here, but I will discuss it briefly be, before we go on. So, um, where was I? Okay, now, safety stock. Safety stock, simple definition, is stock delivery held with the intention of meeting unpredictable demand or protecting against unreliable supply. And there's various factors involved. And once again, there's several safety stock calculations. Um, I'm gonna add a reference to the class uh, tomorrow or Tuesday that'll that'll let you look at the different types and different ways to calculate safety stock but basically we we calculate safety stock depending on the demand rate uh, how much you know the rate of demand over a certain period of time um, how fast the the stock can be replaced that's our lead time obviously uh, for supply then the, the replenishment lead time so the replenishment lead time has basically three factors involved. Um, order lead time, production lead time, and transportation lead time. And all that together is, a, is your complete replenishment lead time. So if you want the entire lead time, you would add your supply responsiveness to, um, well, it's tough because supply responsiveness sometimes includes the replenishment lead time. So basically from the time that it's ordered to the time that it gets to to where it is sold. So replenishment lead time, this is kind of used in like lean supply chains. So they break it out so it's easier to attack. But um, supply responsiveness can either be part of the replenishment lead time or it's just basically how long it takes for the supply system to make the product. Then the replenishment lead time is how long it takes for that, that product to get to where it needs to go. So that's just, uh, Overall, when, what we deal with lead time is it's a combination of those two numbers. So once again, this is a little bit outside the scope. It's just for your for your for your use. So uh, factors including uh, influencing safety stock placement. Um, now this is where the z-score comes in. Okay, uh, basically um, the z-score is the willingness to um, well, it's how risk averse a management wants to be with their customer service level with their safety stock and basically i'm not i don't know if I've let, let me see if i have a graphic to, to bring up here I, I think i do hold on um let me see so basically the customer tolerance time um we have a z-score which basically is the statistical likelihood that we will cover all of our consumer customer demand. And it's related directly to the number of standard deviations from the mean that we want to, to cover with um, safety stock. Let me see if I can find a graphic. I, I had a graphic. Um, let me see. Yeah. Just give me a quick second, see if I can find it. Um, Cause I kind of want to go through this if I can find the graphic. Um, well, let me, um, I actually have a video that I can, I will, I will play here in a minute. Um, I can play in a minute that I, that, that I created. So um, variable rate of demand, um, this is the potential for unexpected swings in demand. So once again, a lot of our calculations deal with a constant demand. So if we may 
Um, but th this basically deals with demand variation, okay? And uh, rent supply variation and inventory flexibility. So management basically says, okay, based upon these four main factors, we're going to determine how many sigmas from the, from the mean that we're going to calculate that we want to um, have product for the customer. If you have a customer that's willing to wait, you may use one that may be a smaller sigma uh, from, the, from the mean, assuming that some of your customers are, will be willing to wait. So as a result, you won't have inventory sitting there waiting for them. Oh, here we go. Uh, let's see, whoops. Ah, Z-score calculator, okay. Um, okay, yeah, there's, there's all kinds of ways to do it. There's actually like, the most popular one is, there's like a chart, a general chart, and I think it might be one in the book. Uh, let me see if the reference that I, actually, let me look, uh, you know what, I, I, have a, I have a reference here. Let me bring this reference up to the screen here. I got a lot of stuff going on my screen. So I've got this here, there's a, there you go. So I don't know if you can see, but right here you have this uh, Z score level. This is just a general chart, and this, this is based upon how many, um, Center deviations from the center. So, you know, 84%, basically one sigma, all the way up to, you know, you know three sigma, which is 99.9%. So, um, so management will say, well, you know, we, our stock either is very expensive or we don't mind having, you know, taking the risk of some customers not having their, their stocks. We may go with 90% or 80%. This is, the Z-score is multiplied by the, demand variability to give you your um, your your safety stock so the, so this is the, this is the customer service level so um, if you have a very important customer that you don't want to have them uh, not have a product you may go up to 90 usually 95 is like an industry standard you know all things being equal so um, you sound like you probably may already know all this stuff so I'm just gonna have it here for the uh, for the recording. So, but the but many, uh, management selects a um, customer service level based upon these four variables, and there may be other variables involved. These are the four main ones. So now to calculate safety stock, this is a very general one that is used. It's it's not very complicated. So basically you multiply the Z-score by the standard deviation of your demand, of your lead time. Sorry, I didn't. Uh, um, actually, this isn't, uh, actually, I used this wrong one here. So this is one of them that I've seen is, is you take your Z-score, multiply it by the standard deviation, and then multiply it by the square of the lead time. So um, I did not include this in the graphic here. I think that's one that's used in the in the module. The module uses this one. Let me see if I can pull it up quick. Yeah, here we go. I'll just put up here. So this is what they use here. The the the, the textbook uses um, your z-score times your standard deviation of your demand times your uh, square root of your lead time. So uh, this is directly from the module overview. This is another one here. Basically, this is very simple. And this one uses uh, standard deviation of lead time and the average of demand. There's, well, actually just, oh, sorry, I just wanted to put page 43 of our text. Okay. Um, oh, um, is page 43 of our text? Does that have the, let me go look to the page 43 real quick. Uh, page 43. Oops. Must be chapter one, I think. Page 43. I'm, uh, I'm using the electronic version here, so I'm just going to... Page 41. I'm going to pull my book out. I've actually got a paper copy here. So 43. Table 2-2. Oh, yes. That's exactly, yeah. Um, is it the same? Does it look like it's the same as a chart that my reference has? Let's see. And um, 90 is 1.29, 95 is 1.65. Yeah, it's pretty close. 
So yeah, so uh, and it, it should because it corresponds. Yeah, this corresponds to um, the number. Assuming that your demand lies upon a normal distribution, okay, how how many sigmas from the mean you're you are gonna calculate? So um, as long as you know, I'm assuming that both charts use a normal distribution, so the number should be exactly accurate. One may just round up or we'll round down differently. So um, that's where it comes from. I've honestly got a video. Um, I, I won't play it here, but I will post it in the announcements probably tomorrow. You can, you can click on it. I just made a kind of a cheesy video um, to discuss customer service time and how it works and then how it, how it relates to a normal distribution. So, um, so, but once again, there's many ways to calculate safety stock. And it just depends, you know, um, on the on the data that's being used and how you want to manipulate it. But they all usually use customer service, you know, this the Z score, which is a customer service level. Because this is what you're gonna use to determine how much safety stock you are comfortable with. If you're comfortable with a low level safety stock, you're gonna use a low Z score. If you're not comfortable with a low safety stock and you're willing to, to have some money tied up in inventory, you'll have a high safety stock, uh, a high Z score. So, so when we use this, um, this is a quick safety stock calculation. Um, this is from, uh, I think we've already done this, this, this lesson where we, um, where we had the four warehouses and we're, and we're going to centralize. Um, if we were going to use safety stocks in this, um, basically, this, the safety stock calculation for each leg, uh, based, uh, based upon what I used, is your Z score times the square root of lead time times your variable demand. Okay, so it's fairly simple. So um, in this example, you've got your average demand is 30, demand variation is 10, customer service level 95%, which is normal, and your lead time is one week. I just made a very simple problem. So if you look at the calculation, it's one, you know, it, it, it comes up to 17 per, per location, okay, 17 units. So if you add up all the, um, all the units, you know, the, the, the total inventory plus the safety stock, it comes out to 188 units, all right? So when we move to a centralized or risk pooled distribution strategy, what we do is we use the, the, um, the law of the uh, aggregation of demand. It's basically the sum of the variances of the individual demands are aggregated when the demands are independent of each other. Basically, um, they each are independently pulled from. There's no common factors related to your A, B, C, and D. Now, in real life, there's always some kind of reality, you know, sets in. But the more this is true, the more accurate this is. So, um, like, for instance, let's say this is four different countries. You know, it's very, very, very broad. It's much easier to use risk pooling as a concept. It's much more accurate than if you use, like, uh, four warehouses in the same city. Okay. Because your demands may not be as independent as you would like. So... When you do this, when you aggregate your demand vari variance, you basically take your demand uh, variance at each location, so it's 10 squared, which equals 100. Then you add add all the demand variances. So you basically, since you have four of them and they're all, and in, in this example, they're all the same. In, in real life, they may be different, but in, in this example, they're the same. So you basically add them together. So you have 400, and then you take the square root of the at the aggregated demands, aggregated demand variances, okay? So, and this gives you the new standard deviation. And this is applied right here. So your state stock equals your z-score, 95%, times the square root of lead time times your demand variation. So now it's 1.65 times square root of one times 20. So now the safety stock for a risk pooled location is now 33. So we've just reduced our inventory from 100 to 188 to 153 units just by risk pooling. Now, once again, there's some risk involved. Um, 
you know, uh, unlike people in the classroom said, you know, you have like transportation costs, um, a single warehouse isn't able to absorb as much flexibility, uh, absorb as much variation as multiple warehouses. Um, that's a simple systems rule. Um, but from a basic math standpoint, if all things being equal, you know, you can reduce your in inventory because the amount of city stock is decreased from 33 to uh, this is what, uh, 17 times four. So that's what, 60, uh, 68. So you've pretty much cut the six stock in half by just aggregating your, your uh, demand variances. So um, as I said, if you start to use them, you'll find out that companies have different ways of calculating safety stocks. You know, the one that they use in the textbook is a very generic, general way of calculating safety stocks. Um, then the safety stocks, from my experience, they will add on to it based upon their view of their environment. You know, they may place more of a um, premium on lead time variability. So they'll change the calculation to take and take lead time variability into more consideration. So um, you'll find there's, uh, matter of fact, this, this, this reference that I just placed up here that I'm going to put in the, um, in the class notes. I think it's got like four or five different ways to calculate safety stock. And, uh, they're all pretty good, depending on what you want to do. Um, a quick reminder, um, your group summaries are due that by the end of week five. And in the uh, learning module in Brightspace, it tells you basically what I'm looking for. In general, I just wanted to see how far you've gone. I, I, I don't want to... I don't need to see exactly what they're asking for. I just, but I just basically want, want to make sure that you guys are making progress. Um, if you guys attack the castle from a different angle, that's fine. I'm not too worried about it. I just want to make sure that you guys are on uh, schedule. And um, because the way that Brightspace does it, it's very confusing with how things are posted. So what I've been asking for in the previous class is just have one person from your group um, email me your group progress and then um, at that point when I read it and everything else I will email it back to you with where I think you guys are at and then I will give you guys credit they don't they don't give you point they used to give you points for participation and during these summaries they don't do that anymore it's basically just a check in the block so once I get it, I basically check the block to that everyone in the group has participated. The, the group participation scores come in towards the end. And um, I'll just tell you real quick, they've really increased the amount of points participation takes in the, in the assignment, uh, quite a bit actually. It's like, I think it's like almost half of the entire assignment is participation. It might be half or maybe even more, but it was quite a bit. So yeah, so just, um, I'm going to, I'm going to post something in the classroom tomorrow to basically tell everyone if, if they can just have one person from the group, email me your progress and then I'll give you guys much feedback during week six, hopefully early in, in week six to, to give you enough time to kind of catch up. And then, um, then I'll give you guys credit. Okay. Well, thank you, Eric, for uh, calling in. Um, yeah, please do. Um, I just find that, you know, the first class I had with this Brightspace, it was really chaotic and people were posting to the wrong, uh, well, back then there was a discussion board for every week. So people were putting it on the wrong discussion board and I wouldn't see it. And I'd have to sit through basically five weeks worth of discussion boards times the number of of uh, groups and it was really chaotic. So now it's like just email it to me, I grade it, I mean email back to you guys, life is good. So all right. And that's all I have. If you can't think of anything, there's there's more to this week. I didn't do a lot of what I did in the video lecture that I posted. Um, but if during the week you see something that may need some clarification, let me know. I'll either put something together or I will throw a whole bunch of information up and help you guys out. Uh, so, um, um, 
week five is when it starts to kind of get kind of hard. Um, week six starts to get really bad. Seven is insane. Um, it, seven is not a fun time. So uh, FYI, five starts to get a little hard. Six gets a little hard. Seven is just uh, full bore. It's not, it's, it's not pretty. So I try to be as available to the class as possible, starting about week six, week seven, for that reason. Well, more available to the class, not, you know. Um, so, all right, well, thank you very much. And if there's no other uh, questions, I will sign off and I will talk to you in the classroom. Thanks, Eric.